It's time for Trench Talk, for your weekly infusion of metal and otherwise heavy music. I'm your host, Flight of Icarus, from MetalTrenches.com. As always, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. You can listen on iTunes, CastBox, and also on iTunes and BitChute, where you can get further content on a weekly basis. Also consider checking out our Metal Trenches Patreon. My name is Spencer, Spencer Lynn, and uh, I'm in the Odious. I play guitar and I do the uh, quote unquote clean vocals. <laughs> and um, I write I write the songs as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Th- yeah. Thanks again. And I really wanted to start with there are so many influences listed <laughs> on this band and so i kind of wanted to just start all the way back at the beginning like taking on all these influences wh- where did you start getting interested in all these types of music and how did that lead from there to where you're at now with this album oh man um well i guess it started you know with like grunge music when i was a little kid uh, that was sort of the first, my first introduction into heavier rock. Um, and living in the Pacific Northwest, we've got that, you know, sort of legacy with yeah. Nirvana and Alice in Chains and all that sort of stuff. Um, so those were big influences on me from a young age. And then, you know how it goes with metal. It just kind of, your tastes just progressively get a little bit heavier. Your, uh, your tolerance for, you know, screaming and fast <laughs> drums and everything like that starts to ramp up and up and up. And, and uh, you know, so then I was things like uh, Pantera and Metallica. And uh, before I knew it, I was listening to, you know, in middle school, like Children of Bodom and Lamb of God, you know, some of your more like entry level uh, extreme metal bands, if you will. And uh Then, you know, discovered Opeth probably in like eighth grade. And then it was like, oh, shit, you know, like (laughs) this, this is the peak of music right here. And then that sent me down the path of, you know, the the progressive metal bands uh, between the Barry to me and Faceless and uh, Animosity and the Red Chord. Those were huge, huge influences on us uh, in high school. And um, yeah, it, it. it kind of expanded um, from there. And I realized, you know, towards the end of high school, I, you know, had been listening to so much metal. I was just like, I started exploring other genres as well. Um, more like, you know, jazz fusion and R and B um, just like singer songwritery type stuff. And uh, yeah. And just kind of love all of all different kinds of music, um, you know, to varying like, there's something good about pretty much every genre of music in my opinion. Like, and there's also a lot of, you know, can be a lot of garbage as well. But, uh, <laughs> but I realized like, man, every, almost like pretty much every genre other than like the one I don't fuck around with at all is probably like ska. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one where I think I have to put my foot down and be like, no, nope. the line there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it just became a crazy, you know, stew of of all sorts of influences. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up grunge too. It's always interesting hearing people's trajectories because that's so similar to mine, like eerily similar to mine. Yeah, um, right down to like Opeth being a huge turning point. And um, but I, with you mentioning grunge, it stood out to me just because I feel like there's some pretty strong Alice in Chains elements coming into this album. And I don't know if that's by design or if it's just a, if that just happened. Yeah. Um, it's, it kind of just happened. Um, I mean, it, it's obviously a huge influence that we wear on our sleeve. Um, but I kind of learned how to sing by just singing along to Alice in Chains. And, you know, part of me was just trying to sound like Lane Staley. And then when I realized I kind of had a similar voice to begin with, uh, just like naturally, I suppose, like a little, some of those like nasal tones, you yeah. know, um, 
It is that, very similar. It's disturbingly similar. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I don't. It's like I didn't. Um, I didn't set out to to do that. Um, but then when I realized I could, or that's kind of where my trajectory went. Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't shy away from it to any degree. And and there's a lot of times where I'm like, I mean, it. You know, uh, metal with those kinds of he was always my favorite clean singer you know him and uh just like the way that you can have melodies but they're still so dark you know yeah uh, uh and then the harmonies of course him and jerry cantrell the, their the harmonies they did together always yeah. just gave me shivers Haunting. so yeah yeah it, absolutely so um it's not always a conscious effort to try to sound like Lane Staley at this point. It's very much just kind of comes out like that. And there's been time I I'm, I'm trying to experiment with other ways of singing as well. Um, and to broaden my horizons, cause I don't necessarily just want to be like the, the guy who sounds like Lane Staley, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, a wise but, choice. And, th- and th- those are big shoes to fill too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And really ever to, you know, fill them in any way. Um, but I can't I can't deny that his, he's probably my biggest influence vocally. Yeah, it's cool, too, because I mean, they're an interesting band from that time, too, because they kind of straddled the line between grunge rock and metal and were kind of the only ones sort of doing that at that time and and with your band you're definitely straddling a lot of different styles at the same time as well in a just in a different way and on on that note too another so when i was reading through all of the influences i i had already listened to the album before i even looked at that list and and when i looked at the list i was like okay sounds about right but there was one (laughs) band missing (laughs) from Uh, there that really stood out to me and i was curious if you're familiar with sixth oh yeah absolutely so that was to me like the most obvious comparison and yeah. I don't know if you feel the same way at all, but I was like, there's no way that this guy doesn't know about this band because there's some very obvious uh, similarities here. Yeah. Um, no, I, I love sick. Um, death of a dying. Death of a, death dead, of a, death of a dead day. Yeah. yeah death man. of a dead day. I always think I'm singing. <laughs> I'm like, that can't be the album title, but it is. Um, yeah. I, I love that album when I first discovered that in high school. Um yeah, we were all listening to that nonstop. So absolutely, Sixth is is a huge influence, and the way they tastefully do the you know sort of uh, technical riffage, but still make it very catchy um, and groovy. All of the crazy grooves and the crazy unhinged vocals, you know. Uh, yeah, definite, definitely a big influence. I I didn't really. Uh, I, I need to catch up on their newer stuff because I know that they've been active recently. I managed to see them when they came to the Hawthorne. Um, oh, I was almost at that. Sh- w- did they play with uh, Periphery? Yeah, uh, yeah. I was almost at that show. Oh, man. I was, was all lined up. I even had a photo pass and everything. And then I had like a tragedy in the family and it was unavoidable. I had to fly to Chicago and I missed it. And, you know, I, I don't regret making the right decision of what I needed to prioritize, but I still am like, man, I wanted to see that so bad. Yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. It was definitely a a bucket list, um, band for me personally that, uh, I, I, it was bands you never think you're going to see, you know, and it was very cool, but yeah, that's, that's definitely spot on and a very good observation as far as the sixth influences that's kind of a thing that i i forget that i'm influenced by but it's because it's so a part of my you know musical vocabulary at this point i'm like oh yeah totally you know they're kind of more obscure like especially since before they did their kind of comeback like yeah nobody really knew who they were except for people who were like you know deep into sort of the math core and kind of technical metal progressive metal kind of scene yeah yeah, absolutely. They they belong up there, you know, like without them, there would be no periphery or, you know, whatever you want to classify as gent and all that sort of, 
you know, those all those hot buzzwords. But yeah, sixth was always the very a very sort of uh, uncompromising version of of all of those bands, you know. Uh, so yeah, huge influence. And and when you find something like that, uh, you know, when you're like 14, it just is completely blowing, you know. Yeah, I I remember the first time I saw the music video for Bland Street Bloom, and I was just like. I yeah. I was like this this is crazy. Like I I don't think I'd really heard anything that sounded and I use this phrase all the time unfortunately, but I it's true. Like I had never heard anything like that before. Yeah. No, I, I me neither. Um cuz yeah, the uh yeah, the, I I think I was going through a period of time where I was particularly militant about like no clean vocals in that <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I think most metal fans go through a period like that at some point in their life, you know, and uh, they're one of those bands that lifted me out of that because of how tasteful their clean vocals were. And, um, you know, because like there was that whole period in like, you know, 2008 ish kind of where you're you're hearing you're like asking Alexandria's and you're like Miss May I or whatever, yeah, yeah. I, or, you know, whatever the fuck all those bands and um, I I would never got into the pop punk stuff, you know, which I think is a huge influence on those bands and their their vocals. So, yeah. though all of that, uh, the popularity of that stuff always just mystified me a little bit. And then I probably had a reactionary uh, feeling towards it and just went further down, like just death metal and <laughs> you know, like just heavy shit and. Um, but so sixth was one of those bands where I was like, okay, I guess clean vocals can be cool in metal, you know? Yeah. And they do so much with the vocals in that band. I mean, they, they get kind of, uh, I've heard them called corn core, which I think <laughs> people use as like, a a mean thing to say, but to me, I'm like, no, that, that is kind of what it is like. And that's cool. Like, I mean, yeah. Jonathan Davis is a rad vocalist too. Like I have huge respect for that guy doing something completely different that nobody else was doing at the time. Oh yeah, totally. I totally agree. Cool. So let's move into the album. So I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it properly. Is it Vesica Pisces? Yeah, I think I, we've just been saying Pisces. Pisces. You know? Okay. Like just a normal it's just spelled differently it's um it's a shape yeah it was, it's like an ancient symbol i guess was what i read in the the email promo whatever could you kind of explain that yeah so it's a um it, i found I was reading about freemasonry and like the secrets of the masonic lodges and whatnot and um a lot of it comes back to the Vesica Pisces, which is essentially uh, a Venn diagram type shape. You know, it's two circles intersecting at a very specific ratio. Um, and it makes this sort of, yeah, just a Venn diagram type shape. Um, and at first I didn't really think much of it, but then the more I read into it in the book, it was a very old symbol that was sort of co-opted by the masons and has existed essentially in many different cultures and has had many different meanings um you know for example i think some of the ancient christians thought of it as a symbol of fertility you know um but then there's other places that think of it as like the evil eye or something like that um you know, it, it pops up in Egyptian culture, and it's also the basis for a lot of the sacred geometry type stuff, like the Flower of Life. And you see it on floors in churches and ancient churches, and you see it tucked into all of these different places. And um, yeah, it just it it really sparked a uh, a curiosity for me, and just that sort of. Uh, that strange ambiguity that a symbol like that can have is really interesting to me, especially when it's like so pervasive, when it exists in so many different cultures, you know? Yeah. Um, and I was just like, damn, that's, that's really cool. So it, and when I saw it imme immediately, I was like, that's the name of the album, you know, <laughs> like I want people to look up that shape, you know? <laughs> 
And this album's also kind of like the the third part of a trilogy. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that's um, that's really more from a lyrical perspective. So that would be our vocalist Patrick. He wrote the lyrics in very much a similar fashion, tackling similar things that Joint Ventures was, which Joint Ventures was going after, um, basically like trying to go after universal human truth type stuff um you know very basic thing like exploring sadness or death or happiness you know basic stuff but then coming at it from like a very you know kind of neurotic and and modern and and uh you know scattered sort of perspective and um uh, vesica pisces kind of puts a cap on that because it it sort of brings to a close that whole era for us um which was a very tumultuous time, uh, which is probably why the music turned out so crazy. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, it's still from that perspective, but it's also got the added maturity and sort of, uh, you know, like removal, um, like that sort of third third person removal kind of a thing, I guess I would describe it as where because I'm not the main lyricist by any means, um, but I know we're we're still dealing with the same themes. And whereas uh, the first EP, That Night of Forest Grew, was a narrative concept album, Joint Ventures was more of a loose concept album in that there was narrative going through the whole thing, but it, each song was thematically tied together in a lyrical way and, and tried to tackle you know, uh, different pieces of a whole. And with Vesica Pisces, it's even more sort of zoomed out lyrically, I would say. And, and, um, it's like, the, it's like the same character. I, I want to say, you know, it's like the, the same, it's like Patrick is playing the same narrative character on all three of these albums. And I think he would be able to explain it better because, I mean, in all honesty, the music itself wasn't necessarily written as, like a trilogy like I didn't write all three albums at the same time or anything like that you know but we're like oh stylistically they all fit and then we know the stuff that we have even more material coming down the pipe and we're like that's you know even its whole own thing so we we wanted to wrap it up um in a nice neat little way you know it's always interesting to hear different bands approaches to songwriting because i mean some people start with the lyrics and then others it sounds like with you like the music's already written pretty much all the way before any of the lyrics come into play at all yeah yeah that's that's usually the case and um sometimes i'll have an idea for a lyrical prompt or something like that but usually it's just um i'm just going by my ear and my gut and then that will inspire something within Patrick. Like, you know, he'll hear something and be like, oh, this this makes me think about, you know, uh, uh, some sort of specific emotion. And then I'm like, yes, run with that. You know, we try to keep it more on the more open ended and like kind of fluid in that way, I suppose. So what's going through your mind when you're writing the music usually like what's influencing kind of where that's all coming out? Um, it depends. Sometimes I want to hear a really cool guitar riff, you know, um, other times I have a specific emotion that I'm trying to translate, you know, or, or I, I'm going through a rough time or something like that. And, um, and I basically focus all of my energy on guitar and writing a song. Uh, but most of the time I try just not to think, you know, like at all, like I try to just follow, um, my, my gut and, and try to figure out what feels right. And I try not to second guess myself, um, because I've done that in the past and it's really easy to get bogged down, you know? in like, oh, this sounds like too much like this band or, oh, <laughs> yeah. this is, you know, this has been done before or whatever. And I just try to let myself, 
you know, have the freedom to just like make the music I want to hear, you know, uh, does it make, does it give me some sort of feeling? And then if it does, I just, I try to go with that, you know? Yeah. Is that an advice you'd kind of give to other, uh, musicians out there? (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, especially when you're first writing a song, it's very important to, I don't know, for, there's so many different ways of going about it. It's, it's very subjective, but for me, it's important to set aside that critic, you know, that inner critic and just a, have some fun and like try to follow, try to follow your gut, you know, and, and like that inner sort of melody that you might be hearing in your head and, you know, try to let that flow as much as possible. And when, when you're dealing with, um, you know, when you're thinking about like, Oh, but what are people going to want to hear? Or, Oh, has this been done before? Or, you know, all these sort of, uh, analytical questions, I find that it can really block the creative flow. And even if it's true, like, even if you do write a riff where you're like, Oh, this is totally like a, a rip off, you know, like, write it anyway and then give it some time to breathe you know and come back to it and be like oh you know like i could change it this way and now it's it's like an interesting take on this type of riff rather than a a rip off or you know what i mean like um yeah so i don't know I've, i've i've worked with people who uh they just get very discouraged very quickly when after one session they've written something and it you know it doesn't sound like like the enigmatic finished product that they're, that they want. And I'm like, dude, it takes time. You know, it's like, it rarely does something (laughs) come out like fully formed, you know, you got to give it some time. You got to, I don't know. So anything worth having takes work. That's something I tell people all the time. (laughs) It it takes some effort. Don't expect it to just come to you. Well, so that's so true. That's during the songwriting process, but it makes me wonder too, what's your thoughts then on outside criticism, like after the album's out, like how do you perceive the reactions you're getting from people who are writing reviews and people like myself? Um, I think it's like, you know, completely valid. Um, but do you like take that in or do you try to I know some people like value that and they're like okay I'm going to use this and then other people are like I don't even read that because I don't want it to sort of poison what I'm trying to do yeah um I would say I I'm a bit of like a fence sitter on that where I I mean I would be totally lying if I said I didn't read any of the reviews um but it's not like we've had a ton of reviews you know I don't think like we've had some and for the majority of them have been positive. Like, of course I've seen like comments and whatnot where it's like, Oh, like, like way to go revive Lane Staley from the dead and put it over the faceless, like super original dude. Or, you know what I mean? Like, geez, you know, that's an yeah. oversimplification. If I've ever heard I know, one, I know. And like, when I read that, I'm like, Oh man, you're having a bad day. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I, I don't let that get to me. Um, uh people who somebody's not getting enough love in their personal life right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Someone's got a little too much time on their hands. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I do, um, especially people who like really listen to a ton of music and take their critique seriously. You know, I, I would at least, at least in this point in time, I'd be inclined to, to listen and, and read to what they had to say. Um, and, I guess I haven't been confronted with like a total like panning of anything that I've done yet, you know, and I feel like, you know, that's going to happen if, if like the more successful you get or whatever, you know, if, and hopefully that happens, uh, you know, you, you find people who just don't like your music and I, I know that I can't please everyone, you know, um, and that's just going to be something that happens. And, uh, you know, ultimately I just have to come back to making the music that I want to hear and, you know, hoping that other people out there enjoy it as well. But, um, I'm always going to start from a place of, uh, like a personal place, uh, rather than making something that I think other people are going to want to hear. Yeah. 
Fair enough. Yeah, I I think that's a good way to look at it. I was just kind of curious. That was a um, good question. It yeah. made me. It really made me think. Actually, <laughs> I was like, huh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I've. It's been interesting writing over the couple of years I've been doing it too, and just sort of adjusting my own style and something I've enjoyed that that was like a, a a major kind of like aha shift moment for me that I'm still sort of adjusting is I I didn't like when I would write negative stuff and then the band would like post it or share it or comment and I'd be like oh wow these people are actually reading it and then I'd be like I'd kind of feel bad about what I wrote and I don't want to like be dishonest and not point out things that I feel like could be better but sure. it, it pushed me into a space where I was like, you know what, I'm going to write these in a way as if I'm writing it to the band, like as if I'm talking to them. And yeah. I liked taking that approach because then even when I had feedback, it kind of forced me to really think about how I was writing it and make it feel constructive instead of just joining in with the typical kind of like shit talking uh <laughs> you know let's let's get people to click on this out of like rage or whatever um and, and move away from yeah. that and and um i've had some bands get back to me too and say they appreciate that so um that's awesome I'm hoping that continues to be a thing <laughs> yeah. well i'm excited to to read what you have to say about the album yeah cool um anything else specifically like about the concept of the album that you want people to know about or musically kind of um, things that you're particularly proud of maybe yeah um we recorded this album all ourselves so we didn't go to a studio or anything like that um which is partially why it took so long um we recorded all live drums uh which vesica uh, uh joint ventures had program drums on it um, and so we were really proud about that because they're very difficult parts and, uh, our drummer Garrett really killed it. And I just, yeah, I'm, I'm just really proud with, um, some of the risks we took, you know, we probably could have gotten the album out faster had we not stuck to our guns in that D DIY sense. Um, but we knew that if we did that, we would probably end up with a more unique product, which is ultimately the kind of stuff that we like um, is, you know, unapologetically just itself, I, I suppose. And um, so I'm really I'm really happy we did that. Uh, all, that was going down. It was very frustrating and it was a difficult process a lot of the times. Um, it's but, a lot of work. Yeah, man. Oh, man. So much work. <laughs> and so, so little money. <laughs> you know what uh -huh. I mean? Like, so it's just, it, it, it was a labor of love. And, and uh, we really poured everything we had into this album. And um, the years following Joint Ventures were really rough for all of us. And so Vesica Pisces is, you know, the culmination of all of those years. So there's really a lot of... Um, there's just a lot of real emotion on the album and um, I'm, I think it translates pretty well. And so I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I gotta say I'm, I'm proud about that, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to keep it moving forward because like I said, we've got, we've got, uh, you know, stuff in the works that is even more different. And um, you know, I mean, it's always going to sound like us, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the future again of music. And there was a, there was a period there where it was, it was getting a little bleak, you know, but, uh, but I'm just glad we all stuck in there. Yeah. Would you be willing to expand on that at all? I'm always interested in people's personal struggles because uh, my main field is actually in counseling. So I, I tend to pry. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Um, well, expand on everything um we just we had a, a lot of member changes um there were i mean it's all stuff that we're probably going to talk about uh at some point in the future but a lot of it isn't really my thing to share you know what i mean fair enough yeah you don't want to um, be putting somebody else's business out there exactly um 
but suffice it to say there was you know a, like 2014 the band more or less imploded on itself um for a myriad of reasons and uh and it was also coming at a time when we were getting label attention and uh you know we had like weird uh like investor people like flying out to see us and stuff like there was a, a good amount of hype around the band at that period of time right after jv and we were playing a bunch of live shows and uh to have everything sort of explode after that was you know pretty devastating especially for for me personally because i hadn't really experienced any sort of like abject failure uh up until that point you know what i mean it, it had been predominantly like us writing stuff and then getting like a pretty good reception like we get, we released uh that night a forest group when we were in high school and we just kind of put it out into the world and lo and behold it was just like at that time where you could still kind of get traction from the internet like randomly like you didn't have to pay facebook you didn't have to you know do all that sort of the stuff good old days yeah. <laughs> i missed a lot of that <laughs> yeah yeah the good old days and uh so they, we were on a pretty solid upward trajectory for a while. So to experience that kind of thing where everything kind of falls apart at once was, you know, pretty, pretty devastating. And, um, and, it, and really forced me to question, like, why do I do this? You know, like, why do I make music? Is it to, like, you know, appear to be successful? Am I being in a band so I'm going to get signed? And I was like, no, that's not why. I started, you know, so obviously I got to keep going, you know, I just, I need to make music because that's the only thing that, you know, makes me feel like a complete person, you know? And, um, yeah, so I don't know that we, yeah, we had member changes and, you know, issues within all of our personal lives and stuff. And, you know, basically adulthood just hit us like a, uh, a pile of bricks. Yeah, you know? I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh we we definitely weren't ready necessarily. So um I don't think anyone is. I think anyone who says they were is a fucking liar. <laughs> absolutely, dude. Well that's that's the funny thing. Like I do have friends who like they they've been adults like their whole lives. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like I'm like it's not fair, you know. But then they look at people like me and you know other dudes in the band and they're like yeah but i went i want your like creativity yeah you, you know? miss things doing that yeah exactly so it's you know it's a it's a trade-off and we're all still trying to find the right balance but yeah um I mean, yeah it, it sounds yeah. like it's all you know driving forward and what you're describing is like kind of it's it's a very sort of cognitive behavioral thing you're sort of redefining like okay my life is different now and and this thing is happening now that's really hard so how am i going to derive my own meaning from it and i was actually just talking about this uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, chris hornbrook from um poison the well and oh. we we're talking about the idea of how you know it's not that you know, life necessarily inherently has meaning. It's about like, you know, shit happens and it's sort of up to you to figure out like, how do I put meaning to this that continues to drive me forward instead of just sort of collapsing into a heap and, and throwing in the towel and blaming this thing or blaming that thing or uh, just deciding that it's not even worth it anymore. And it's yeah. it's not always an easy thing, but I feel like that's one of the most necessary things that anyone has to do to be uh not even, i was gonna say successful but like it's not even always gonna lead to success it's just a matter of con continuing on <laughs> yeah. totally man yeah it's like uh just being okay with who you are you know which i would consider in today's day and age a form of success you know because there's plenty yeah. of people who you know, have what we would deem as financial and, 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 you know, cultural success, but, you know, maybe they're not okay with who they are and, you know, fuck man, <laughs> like <laughs> that's, that's a heavy thing to carry around no matter how much money you have, you know? Yeah. Everyone's, uh, everyone's got problems. They're just different. Like, I mean, I see that in my field too, cause I work with kids from like the most impoverished 
areas you can find. And then I work with other kids that are from super affluent neighborhoods and they've all got their own shit to work through. Like it's, it's not necessarily that this is easier. This is harder. It's, it's, it's all different. And, um, yeah. (laughs) Totally, man. Yeah. I mean, just, just, just the human, human condition is, uh, you know, life itself is, is, I've always thought that life itself is so metal. You know what I mean? (laughs) From a young age, I was like, since I could, you know, since I knew what metal was, I was like, damn, life is so metal. Like we're just born and we don't even know why. And then you're, you can kind of like conceive you, we have the ability to conceive of like a perfect life supposedly, or we get glimpses of it, but it's inevitably going to go away. You know, everything goes into dust, uh, you know, no matter what. And that can be a, a, a relief to, to truly understand and internalize, but it's metal as fuck. You know, it's like, it's, it's brutal. And, uh, it is, it's very brutal. (laughs) Yeah. And so, uh, you know, to go back to what you're saying about, you know, all different people having, um, problems like yeah it doesn't matter who you are or you know what sort of group you identify with or whatever there's like these basic human like these basic constructs of human life that i think anyone who has taken a breath you know or at least you know lived a while can can relate to and that's that's always the stuff that has really interested me and that's been kind of the, uh, that's like the overarching theme I would say of the trilogy and Vesica Pisces sort of closing the chapter on that both, you know, from a, from a a conceptual perspective and just like within our own lives, you know, like it's, it's a closing of a chapter for us in a lot of ways. Yeah. And finding the next one. (laughs) It's a constant recalibration. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's exciting, you know, yeah. And that's, that's a great way to put it. Like it's, it, how do you reframe it? Like, it makes me even think of like when I became a dad for the first time, it was yeah. like, I had this idea in my head before then of kind of what I wanted my life to be and all this like freely free, just freeloading kind of like things I wanted to just do for myself. And at yeah. first when, you know, I got into dad mode, it was kind of like a grieving process of feeling like, oh, wow, like I have to give that stuff up because I'm not going to be able to do it anymore. And it had to be me getting out of that mindset and saying, I'm not giving anything up. I'm I'm excited. I need to get excited about I'm doing this other stuff instead. Like, what yeah. what do I have to look forward to now? How am I going to like recalibrate and take this new direction and get really stoked about that? And um, yeah, <laughs> I feel like that's something that um, everyone has to do all the time and, and musicians too, especially when, you know, bands are tumultuous places. This is part of the reason why I have not been in a band in a very long time, (laughs) because I'd say being in a band is almost harder than being a parent and being a a partner to someone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, it's a very strange, uh, you know, it's like a five way platonic, it's a lot of people to please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the logistics of it, um, are, are, are completely ridiculous and, um, yeah, it's, it's so hard, man, but it's like when it's working, you know, uh, it makes it all completely worth it. You know, like any sort of relationship, like, yeah, well, you know, uh, obviously there's like toxic ones and whatnot, but when things are, when the gears are turning and you're working with people who are on the same page as you, um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing feeling, you know? Um, but man, I don't, I don't know that it's harder than parenting, you know? (laughs) Like maybe I should, maybe I should reframe that. It's not harder. It's just different. (laughs) Like I said before. Sure. It's you're dealing with adult children rather than actual. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I've I've had a few guitar players like that. <laughs> oh, and spe- speaking.
speaking of that random question so yeah. i was r- looking over the information again before we got on here and why are there four bass players on this album <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well basically because it was you know like you said it's just very hard to get people <laughs> You do things, especially when there's um, not really money involved. And um, we we play kind of weird, meandering, complex music. And um, it can I've always been of the mindset that I really don't want to have to nag someone to play this music um, or to practice because the only way it's ever going to turn out right is if you're self-motivated and are doing it out of a, you know, a place of, of love. And so that, that was kind of an issue in some risks, in some regards, as far as like, you know, getting people to do it. Um, I ended up doing a lot of it because of that, you know, and I'm not really, I wouldn't even consider myself a bass player. Um, but it was just like, man, this has to get done. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, I don't, I don't feel like, you know, pulling teeth in order to make it happen. Um, and so like, I'm, I'm really thrilled about the contributions we did have. Like Austin, um, did the first two songs on the album and he, he's like a, just a ridiculously crazy bass player. And he's, he's the, the bass player that we're going to, uh, get to play with us live. Um, but he's also just a really busy guy and, um, you know, just didn't really have time for, to do the full thing, at least in the, the, within the time period that we wanted. And then my other friend, uh, Michael, who I played music with for a while, he, you know, shreds the fretless bass. And I was like, well, oh, we got to get there, you know? <laughs> and, um, I don't know, like a a part of me has been really toying with because I I actually liked how it turned out. And I like, um, you know, one thing I've noticed about metal is that a lot of albums uh, throughout their runtime have this uh, can sound a little homogenous, you know, where it's like the product. It's like the production doesn't change from song to song. It's like the whole song, like the, every drum, every snare hit sounds, has to sound the exact same over the entire album, you know? And it's like, well, what if you have a song where, you know, the drums are just panned to the left ear or, you know what I mean? Like there, when you listen to like a Led Zeppelin album, for example, like each song has like a different production style. Yeah. And there's and, those little imperfections too, where like they, they're, they're kind of like missed a note or missed a beat or whatever. And that adds to the charm of it. Yeah, Totally. And, um, that's, that's something that I have been really into lately. And, um, and I've, I've been enjoying collaborating with a bunch of people and, you know, the odious is always going to be primarily like Patrick and I are the two original members and, um, we're the ones who really like slave over the music. And in the future, I foresee us working with a lot of different musicians to, complete the albums, uh, which is what I would like to happen, you know, and, um, maybe turning it into more of a collective type of a thing. I'm not really sure what even that would entail, you know, but, uh, sometimes just the whole, you know, band lineup thing seems a little constricting unnecessarily sometimes. Cause it's like, well, what if I want, you know, uh, a, jazz drummer on this song <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah. I don't know. um and so that's something i've been toying around with um in my head and that's kind of we kind of started going down that route first out of necessity on this album but then it turned into something fun like we had our old guitar player aaron play throw down a uh, moog on a bunch of tracks well really one main track but he you know he appears in other parts like little Easter eggs. Um, we had people, um, my roommate throw in some backup vocals and I don't know. I just, I don't know if I'll always feel this way, but it was just kind of like the more the merrier and it made it sound, um, just more vibrant, you know? Yeah, no, it's a cool idea. And I think it lends itself well to the style of music that you're playing, which is already very eclectic. So yeah, I'd be interested to see what comes of that. And it's always just cool to have like guest people come in, come in for 
you know, whatever. I mean, the, 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 with all, how all over the place this album is, like, I could totally see you taking in some people to do, like, horn or saxophone or, you know, sure. somebody come and play piano, whatever, like, just doing some wild stuff. Accordion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mouth harp, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we're, uh, we're, we're pretty open to, to anything at this point. Who's been your favorite band to see live personally? Mm, that is a tough one. Um, I mean, I would say Meshuga, as far as metal goes, they take the, they take the cake. They're, they're, Man. they're all of our dads, you know, <laughs> Like they just put us all in our place. Like, oh, you you guys think you are heavy? Oh, oh well, it turns out you're doing you're doing a really good job, champ. But this is what actual heavy sounds like, you know. And uh, <laughs> you, they just take you to school every yeah. time you see did them live. And, did you see yeah. them at their crystal ballroom with a uh, code orange? I did. I Man, did. Yes, yeah. indeed. Was, I, w- was, I was I was there taking pictures. That was like a dream come true because I've been I told this story already on another episode, but I remember the very first time I was in a car with friends and I heard uh, Future Breed Machine and I was probably yeah. like 15, 16 when that happened. So to be right in front of the stage in front of the barricade with them just screaming in my face (laughs) and to hear that song played was like a completely unreal moment damn that's so awesome yeah that's like that's a full circle type situation right there yeah it was like a spiritual thing and then code orange was fucking awesome too that was really cool to see kind of the it was like the old school and the new school kind of coming together and just playing an absolutely rad show yeah oh yeah i've i saw code orange that was that show was great i saw them um at the analog when the analog was still open and man people they just destroyed that place like (laughs) just oh like there were so many i mean they had to like stop the set a few times because of all the fights that were happening they're an aggressive band (laughs) band, dude like yeah it's it's not surprising that people just get pissed listening to their music you know um that's my favorite like gym music now like that in harm's way like i crank that on and i can lift like an extra like 50 pounds (laughs) yeah dude yeah the that just uh unapologetic hardcore metallic hardcore and i like all of the industrial influences they've been adding yeah yeah i think that's really cool um so I was always kind of wondering where they're going to take their sound. It seemed like they were too sort of like restless to stay on just the purely hardcore thing for too long, you know? Um, but man, another band that I've really been digging that I've got to see a few times is Conjurer from, uh, from the UK. Mm-hmm. They kill it live and they're, they're definitely, a. um, I mean, they've been around for a while, but they're, they're kind of on the, the upcoming, uh, they're one of the upcoming bands. And I had the pleasure of seeing them over in Wales when, uh, I went over there for my sister's graduation. She goes to school in London or she used to. And I went to a random uh, metal show in Wales with a friend and oh, that's cool. saw them. Yeah. And I had never, you know, just kind of went in blind and then they just blew me away. And, um, I started telling everyone I knew about them and, I'm like, I know, like my the the uh, the narcissist in me wants to think that I played a little helping hand in getting them over to the United States, just because I was showing all my friends and shouting, <laughs> <them out. laughs> you know. But I know that's uh, they're just an incredible band. Yeah, it is cool you know, to have that feeling though of like of those, trying to like, like champion should... something and and getting people on board with it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then it works. Like now they're going to be opening for Voivod and Revocation on a big U.S. Canadian yeah. tour, and um, you know, so and then they here. get and then they get too big, and you're like, "Fuck that, yeah. man! They're they're yeah. too mainstream now." Yeah. Like I liked them before they were cool. Now yeah. they're sellouts. <laughs> totally <laughs> stab them in the back on the way out. <laughs> right. Of course, because you know, yeah, they they sold 
they sold me out, man. Like I was, <laughs> <laughs> even though they don't know who I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they're great. Yeah. They're a really killer live band. Um, yeah. and they're out of, com- out of a completely different region of the UK, I think, but are you familiar with sludge? Oh yeah. Yeah. I got to talk with Matt Moss on another episode. That was pretty cool. We, oh. Cool. We talked for almost two and a half hours because he yeah. has like insomnia and it was like <laughs> some ungodly hour for him. And Holy he shit. talked all about like, you know, they've got the drummer from the Black Dahlia now. And he talked about like just what led up to this crazy concept. And then he also told this insane story about uh, being in a mental institution for three years. And what? and it was just wild. Um so anyone who's listening to this who hasn't listened to that episode who finds that interesting, I highly recommend checking that one out. Um, and the full length version is only on YouTube, but that was one of my favorite conversations so far. But that that is a super interesting dude right there, and he makes awesome music. Yeah, I would man, I would love to talk to that guy. I'm definitely gonna go listen to that too. Yeah, he's totally chill. Like honestly if you just like hit him up somewhere, he'd probably be like, Oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> just cool. super cool guy. Um, and very put together despite like this history he told me about, like I was shocked genuinely cause I never would have guessed, uh, that he had any sort of like mental illness issues in his past. Cause most people like still kind of show it in some way, but the only way he shows it is he makes metal about slugs, so maybe I should have seen, <laughs> seen it coming. Uh, yeah, the signs were there. Yeah, yeah. But that's really cool. Um, man, I don't have any mental. I don't have any. Well, I don't know about mental, illness, but I don't have any mental institution stories. Yeah. No, it's cool. This is this has been really interesting too, just in general. I was also curious, like, do you have any favorite local bands? Since we're both in Portland, talking here. Oh yeah. Um, I do. Let's see. Uh, I mean, obviously vitriol, they're killing it right now. Um, on the death metal front. Uh, I really like Asetas. I think that's how you say it. Um, A S E I T A S. They are a really cool band. They've got a, a full length out and they're really solid live kind of dissonant, uh, sludgy, but then they'll pick up the pace, you know, so it's it's a really cool mixture of uh, like death metal genres. Um, let's see. Um, we're good friends with the dudes in Bystander. So they're always a band that I'm going to recommend. They're they're just a really a fun, good, slammy sort of time. I mean, I slam purists would scoff at me calling them slam <laughs> yeah those slam boys they get serious about that oh, stuff and man. <laughs> and that's one thing that i could really do without in the metal world is elitism just the, well the elitism that is spawned by like all the sub genreification or whatever you want to call it like the the taxonomy like the the uh you know like actually that's more that's more death grind than grindcore you know i'm just like oh wow i all of a sudden don't care about (laughs) like you know like i don't know like i i understand like there are differences and um these are classifiable subgenres but i'm i'm just always shocked by the people who uh you know yeah who are like this one is so much better than this one and i don't know it's yeah it's to me, it's all like the context. If it becomes toxic in a way to like kind of shit on someone for like being wrong, so to speak, I don't like that aspect of it. I do appreciate just the basic taxonomy of it, though, because as somebody who listens to so much music on a regular basis, it helps when I get an email that is very descriptive about some like ridiculous super niche subgenre it is because it that yeah. stands out to me and i know what they mean when they say that and yeah. i even and and also like i actually really appreciate too like the for fans of section i know it's it, i feel like it's become mm. kind of popular to sort of make fun of that and say that that's like a lazy way to describe a band but i'm like that's the fastest easiest way to let somebody know whether or not they might be interested in checking this out and it's like yeah, yeah. don't don't stop there but 
um, I think that's a good starting point to get someone in the door and then you can kind of go on further about, you know, what, what else is going on besides that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I've always thought the, the for fans of thing is just a very, uh, very logical way of going about it, you know? Yeah. No, and it's also interesting to see, like, if, especially if it's written by the band to see, like, it's kind of like who they consider themselves to sound like as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you get a lot of information from that. So it's interesting that there's these circles now where it's like not cool to do that. But yeah, fuck no, those totally. people. <laughs> Dude, oh my god! And and it's just like you know you you made a really good point about yeah just the um the the taxonomy and the breakdown of of you know the splintering of the metal world into a thousand million different little subgenres. Um, is really interesting, especially considering like, I think most metal heads at one point in time, they were like meathead bikers, you know, back in like the eighties. <laughs> and now they're just like nerds, you know, yeah. like I'm, I'm definitely like a nerd or, you know, like a soft nerd. I wouldn't necessarily call myself like a, a hardcore nerd, but there's like, you know, there's something very, uh, like analytical and, you know, most, uh, metal fans are very appreciative of technicality and, and that sort of thing. And so I think it lends itself to that, um, you know, that breakdown of, you know, uh, kind of picking things apart and, and classifying them. Um, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, just when it gets like people getting heated arguments over whether something's blackened crust, or <laughs> sludge, I'm just like, dude, like, I don't know. Like, if you show this to anyone walking on the street, they wouldn't even hear the difference. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, which is always, you know, something that I feel like is, uh, obviously frustrating for a metalhead, but then it's something that it, it should, you should think about that. You should, and then like, remember to not take yourself so seriously because, yeah. like, you know, there is a point where the rest of the world hears this stuff and they're just like, yeah, I mean, it's noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You it know? is interesting to step back from it and recognize that there's there's a whole majority of people out there really that not only do they not hear those little subtleties, but they just hear pretty much any loud, angry band the same way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well they once they hear the screaming, it's like a switch is flipped in their head and they're eyes like glaze over it's like they're protecting yeah. themselves you know from the whatever sort of emotional onslaught that yeah that metal is uh thrown at them yeah. but yeah i've i've had many a conversation where i've tried to you know show someone the difference between like uh like even just like black metal and death metal you know mm -hmm. which to me are very obvious right Right. You know, like when you're in it, like clearly there's a difference. But yeah, yeah you, you play it for somebody who just listens to pop music all day and not to shit on them, but like they just right. their ears haven't acclimated to it yet. Yeah, exactly. It's like it. And I always forget, like, how long it took me to, you know, get to that level. Like it wasn't like I was just one day listening to Morbid Angel or, you yeah. know, um, it was like. You know, it took years and years of like, oh, there was a point where I thought Pantera was the heaviest shit I'd ever heard, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it it takes it's baby steps, you know? Yeah. I said um, on another episode, too, that I actually couldn't even get into like Dark Throne and Mayhem and all that stuff until really just a couple of years ago. Like mm, I was introduced yeah. to it a long time ago. But back then, even though I was listening to like melodic death metal, like dark tranquility. And then I was listening to Opeth and I was listening yeah. to Meshuga, but Sweet. it was like, I drew the line there though. Like somebody played dark throne for me and I just didn't get it. But then, you know, years later it, it just clicked. <laughs> yeah, dude, absolutely. That's how I feel about, um, yeah, more of that dissonant stuff, like Ulcerate, Death Spell Omega. Yeah. Dude, Ulcerate yeah. is the shit. <laughs> They're the shit, man. Like, that, to me, now I love that. Like, if I want to listen to metal, I'm going to listen to, 
you know, gore guts, ulcerate, Despel Omega, like, yep. you know, like, let's not beat around the bush. Like, if we're going to do metal, let's do it, like, to the... All the way, yeah. Yeah, all the way. Um, I saw ulcerate play here, too. Um, yeah, dude, I was at that show as well, at the Tonic. Yeah, with, yeah, with Zrine. Yeah. That was a fucking that, rad lineup, man. <laughs> that, was, that was so cool. You know, if you like Ulcerate, and yeah, I keep like calling out the other episodes right now, but fuck it, whatever. Uh, you'll probably be interested in these guys because they play very similarly yeah. to Ulcerate. They're out of Denver. They're called Noctambulist. Okay. And they cool. dropped an I album. Know. I think it was their first album uh, this year. Um, and it, it is really good. And we chatted and they are big Ulcerate fans. That's like a primary influence for them. Very similar sound. And I think they're already working on new material. Very cool dudes too. Cool. Yeah. Um, I've been listening to Bearing Teeth as well a lot. You ever listen to that band? I haven't spent a lot of time with them, but I, the name sounds familiar. And you got to bear yeah, with that- me. I've got like a million... <laughs> songs in my rotation right now no i'm, I'm sure it's uh man that, yeah it's never been more overwhelming i'm sure to you know be either, you know a music fan a music critic like just the sheer volume that's out there is is daunting you know yeah it, like, <laughs> it really is like it's anxiety provoking at times but it's a good it problem is. to have yeah yeah, definitely. It leads to the whole option paralysis thing, I find. Um, but usually I try to just like, you know, pick a few albums a month and like just try to make it through those, you know, and then knowing that there's no way to hear everything, you know, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah. it's I, I try to do that work for everyone else. That's that's kind of <laughs> the daunting task that I try to take on is sift through as much of it as I can and try to present as many of the like stuff that rises to the top as I yeah. as I possibly can, but I'm I I mean, who the fuck am I? So, <laughs> you know, what I like somebody else might hate and what I uh hate, you know, somebody else is going to love too. So, uh I'm definitely not the the fi- I don't pretend to be the final say on anything plus there's like big genres i miss out on like i'm just not generally a big doom metal fan and so Mm -hmm. i try to point out that i have that blind spot like i don't review a lot of doom but that that doesn't mean i think that doom is shit like i know there's a lot of great doom bands out there yeah yeah i mean yeah in in portland too there's they're all about the doom here yeah they are (laughs) um but yeah i i feel that that Doom has to be done in a very, uh, very specific way, I suppose, for me to, to really get on board. But I, I've always have a lot of fun at live Doom shows. They're, they're, uh, they're very cool and like a, you know, a weird kind of zen. Yeah, the zen vibe of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, you're doing, uh, you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> you're, through, you're sifting through the heaps, I'm and uh, you know, this, it takes. This- yeah yeah there's too Explosion. much though like i step back from it and i'm like this is like a f- I, i'm barely scratching the surface here um, <laughs> and i constantly find myself like wishing i could listen to all the things but it's just not possible so yeah. what are you gonna do well anything else you want to make sure that you share or plug before we kind of move to close here um we uh we've got merch happening on our Bandcamp page if you just search the odious on Bandcamp, we've got some cool shirts up there i'll put a we'll... link down in the description too awesome dude um and yeah the album comes out june 21st so in two weeks uh, and i'm sure you know maybe by the time this is out it'll be out but you know uh stream it buy it do whatever just you know listen to it and show your friends and have a good time you know yeah people if you like it, buy it, buy your music. I can't say that yeah. enough because otherwise it, it goes away. Like there's plenty of cool bands out there. I mean, you sound like the type of person who, even if you made zero dollars, you would continue making it. But realistically, oh, yeah. like people got to eat <laughs> yeah. and people got to pay for yeah. studio time. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I've, I've got a weird complex where I just, you know, even if you cut off all of my limbs, I would, try to find a way to keep making music but um i don't know 
it's not uh but yeah money's good i would you know so i'm not <laughs> I would do that um but yeah man i appreciate you having me on here yeah man it, it's been good having you it's been a good conversation it's always nice when it, it just kind of uh flows but um yeah thank you so much for giving me all this time and i'll let you know when uh i i put this up absolutely dude have a good right. one yeah, man. later later you can talk your way out of everything that'll do it for this episode of trench talk thank you as always for listening and for all of your support please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already again we are on itunes Castbox, youtube and bit put out new episodes every week stick around listen to our back catalog of episodes if you're new share episodes with friends we're always looking to grow our audience and if you're a returning listener and you feel like you're getting added value out of this podcast be it from learning about new bands, getting a laugh, getting some motivation and positivity, whatever, consider hitting up our Metal Trenches Patreon page. Just a dollar a month makes a huge difference, but if you join at the $5 or $10 tiers, you get some added perks there, including hearing these podcasts early and also getting shout-outs on the podcast, whether it be you, your band, whatever. Also, in addition to following us on social media, we do have a mailing list that I send out personally every Friday. That is the best way to make sure that you do not miss any content because, as many of you probably know, social media is freaking garbage right now (laughs) and is not usually kind to sites like mine. You will often just not even see it in your feed, so you won't even know when stuff is going on. But that will not happen if you are on the mailing list and you also make sure that it doesn't wind up in your spam folder. But that'll do it for me. This is Flight of Icarus signing off. I will see you in the trenches. (laughs) 